Monsters have been the face of our irrational fears and captured our imaginations since the beginning of time. Like our fears, they come in all shapes and sizes and meet us in our nightmares. They can be physical manifestations of evil, serve as metaphors that reflect our current anxieties, or they can be cautionary tales about the consequences of meddling with the natural order. Since their inception, movies have been the perfect medium to explore the darker corners of our minds and molded the iconic depictions that we will forever associate with these movie monsters. On this video, we are going to explore the history of the most iconic movie monster ever, the vampire. Dracula proves just how timeless these creatures really are by appearing in more films than Batman, Sherlock Holmes, or James Bond. In fact, more than any other character of all time. Vampires have existed in Eastern European folklore for centuries, tracing back to the 1700s. However, if we dig a bit deeper, vampire-like creatures date all the way back to Mesopotamia, the earliest civilization. The lore has evolved and stayed relevant by drawing from many different influences as time passed. However, there are several motifs that have remained pretty consistent throughout the years. Vampires are cursed to live for an eternity feeding on human blood. They are sometimes shapeshifters able to turn into bats, smoke, and even wolves. Sorry, it's not a sixer. A vampire must be invited into a home to enter it and cast no reflection in the mirror. Crucifixes, silver, garlic, and holy water are all lethal, while the sun, a stake through the heart, and or decapitation are fatal. Many of these tropes are found in Bram Stoker's Dracula. It was published in 1897 and is by far the most influential interpretation of the vampire to date. However, if we look back a bit further, it's evident that vampire stories and popular fiction had existed for at least a hundred years prior. In fact, in 1816, while Mary Shelley was busy writing Frankenstein, Lord Byron's private physician John Palladori was busy creating another icon, the modern vampire. It's been theorized that Lord Byron himself was the inspiration behind the aristocratic bloodsucker that we typically see in vampire fiction today. Fast forward another hundred years, and the vampire made it to the big screen with an unlicensed adaptation of Bram Stoker's well-known novel. This film, of course, was Nosferatu. Nosferatu created its own grotesque interpretation of Dracula by the name of Count Orlok. He was disfigured and looked a lot like a rat, but despite that, he was able to play a role that was both terrifying and sympathetic. Stoker's estate was understandably pissed and ordered that all copies be destroyed. Luckily, a few still exist today. According to Rotten Tomatoes, Nosferatu is the second best reviewed horror film of all time. Which if I'm not mistaken means that it's definitively the second greatest horror film of all time, regardless of your own personal preference. 1931 marked an important milestone in the rise of vampires in film. Bela Lugosi was cast to play the title character in Universal's Dracula. This is perhaps the most recognizable of his various appearances, and the one that you can pick up in pretty much any discount bin at a Spirit Halloween. Universal's Dracula, along with the other iconic monsters, were a hit with audiences, so Universal continued to crank these films out for close to 60 years. Lugosi reprised the role of Dracula many times with many different studios, cementing his place as one of cinema's most recognizable villains. In 1958, Dracula was resurrected, this time thanks to a London-based studio by the name of Hammer. The actor cast this time in the titular role was the brilliant Christopher Lee. His vampire staking nemesis Van Helsing was portrayed by none other than Peter Cushing, proving that George Lucas was most likely a huge fan of these films as both actors played significant roles as villains in the Star Wars films. This was the first vampire film shot in full color and was a much darker and bloodier take on the story meant to appeal to the sensibilities of a new generation of moviegoers. It also began to explore the more erotic elements of the story that were only hinted at in previous films. Between 1960 and 1974, 
Hammer produced eight more Dracula films, with Lee reprising his role in all but two of them, one being the kung fu crossover, The Legend of the Seven Vampires. I've actually seen this movie, and to be honest, it's about as awesome as its title. Martin was written and directed by George A. Romero in 1978. Martin focuses on a young man who drugs, undresses, and slices the wrist of young women in order to feed on their blood. While he attributes it to mental illness, his uncle believes that there are more supernatural elements at work and that Martin must be stopped. The movie is upsetting, surrealist, ambiguous, and it doesn't even reveal its hand after the credits roll. This is a movie that you definitely won't forget. The 1980s were a major game changer when it comes to the legacy of vampires. More films were being produced than ever before, paving the way for more diversity in the genre. 1985 saw the release of two major movies, Fright Night and Life Force. Life Force is a sci-fi horror mashup that was based on a novel called The Space Vampires. In it, a team of scientists discover what may be three survivors aboard a bizarre spacecraft that they found on the back of Halley's Comet. One of the three being a really hot, really naked woman that goes around shang Tsunging fools by draining them of their life force and shape-shifting into them. If that sounds like your flavor of weird, then bon appetit. In Fright Night, Charlie Brewster's neighbor Jerry is a vampire playboy that has his sights set on Charlie's girl Amy. Charlie has to recruit the help of a late night horror host named Peter Vincent to stop his neighbor before he makes Amy his immortal bride. The film borrows from classics like Rear Window and deftly mixes elements of horror and comedy while still having a strong story and likable characters. Oh, you're so cool, Brewster! <laughs> You think we just work in a comic book store for our folks, huh? Actually, I thought it was a bakery. We're dedicated to a higher purpose. We're fighters for truth, justice, and the American way. In 1987, Joel Schumacher directed a film that would leave a lasting impression on pop culture. Lost Boys is the story of a single mother moving her two teenage sons to Santa Carla, California, and them having to adapt to a new life in a new town. Only, this town happens to be full of vampires. Michael, the oldest son, is transforming after drinking blood in a coven of hair metal vampires, and only his younger brother and a couple of comic-reading vampire slayers can save him. This movie relates vampirism to rebellious youth and the angst of being an outsider. The cast, the monster makeup, the music, the comedy, the Frog Brothers, this movie is incredible. One thing about living in Santa Carla, I never could stomach. All the damn vampires. Another movie released that same year was Near Dark, making 1987 maybe the all-time greatest year in vampire cinema. Near Dark was a spin on the classic western and was helmed by the director of Point Break, Hurt Locker, and Zero Dark Thirty. Catherine Bigelow. At the time, she may have been little more than James Cameron's wife, but this movie was her calling card. Near Dark is the story of a young man who was recently converted and has to learn to adapt to his new life with the help of a very unconventional family. It's basically an Aliens reunion featuring Lance Henriksen, Jeanette Goldstein, and a scene-chewing Bill Paxton. There's a scene in a bar that rivals the one in Desperado. In fact, it rivals the church scene in Kingsman. It's a fucking bloodbath. Hey, I wanted to thank you guys for coming by to check out this video. If you liked it, do me a favor, take just a second and click that little thumbs up button to let me know. And if you want to catch part two of the Vampire series where we discuss vampires and film from the 1990s to present day, or you want to catch the rest of this entire movie monster series, be sure to click the subscribe button followed by the enable notifications bell, that way you can know when each new video is dropped. I'm thinking of doing either werewolves or zombies next time, so let me know which one you want to see more and leave some suggestions for some others that you want to learn more about. I'm Jeremy, signing off.